Dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure on behalf of uh, Habitat Norway to welcome you all to this Habitat Day uh, event from the Polytechnical Association of Norway here in Oslo. I would in particular like to welcome today's speakers, Professor Katrin Golda Pongratz from Barcelona, Anna Claudia Rosbach with us from uh, Brazil, and Gabriel Quixta present here in uh, the studio. I would also like to welcome uh, the vast audience on uh, YouTube and uh, the not so vast audience uh, here in uh, uh, the studio. I would also like to thank the Ministry of uh, Local Government and uh, Modernization for providing funding for this Habitat Day uh, event. A word of thanks also to Secretary General Mette Wognes Eriksen of the Polytechnic Society that regrettably couldn't be with us today. And her technical staff for facilitating uh, this production. Today's theme, land occupation, self-help, livable cities, has for Habitat Norway since its inception 33 years ago being maybe the central issue. It reflects the importance of affordable and safe housing. Thus, consistently, consistently, we have in our advocacy work promoted land tenure security as a necessary condition for housing development, inclusion, and overall sustainable development. Crucial also for climate, peace, and security. The historic starting point for today's event is the Barriadas movement of Lima, Peru of the early 1960s. And how it has evolved over uh, six decades. This is documented in two films that we are going to uh, screen. The first film is from uh, 1964, initiated by the uh, UN Information Center. And the second one, the other one, from 2018, co-directed by Professor Katrin Golda Pongratz, who we are very pleased to have with us uh, today from uh, Barcelona. Barriadas are believed by some to be the only way in which, with government acquiescence, Peru has been able to cope with the demands of millions of people for housing and social mobility. Others see Barianas much more uh, negatively, as slums and as problems. For some, the solution would be to build entirely new cities instead of slum. Uh, upgrading. Recent developments suggest that far from being peripheral and a drain on the society and the economy of uh, Lima, the informal economies of Barriadas may have been, in fact, the catalyst for growth and a fundamental restructuring and reorganization of the whole uh, city. And this is, this is confirmed, which we will hear uh, in the two decade long research of Professor Pongratz. The Barriadas movement is an important part, in fact, of modern development history. John F. Turner, architect and anarchist, through his publication, Housing by People Towards Autonomy in Building Environments, made the ideas of self-help, incremental building and legislation, or spontaneous organization, known to the wider world at the first UN Habitat housing uh, conference in Vancouver in 1976. 
And the World Bank already early in the 1970s, they took this self-help dimension of the movement and turned it into a momentous global housing initiative, the Sites and Services Project, in 55 countries at an average cost of US dollars 42 million. The bank approach was that people should be helped to help themselves without subsidies from uh, the government. Private, international and national NGO consortia were contracted to implement the project in line with, in line with uh, the World Bank's neoliberal uh, ideas. State or private, market or plan, mix or no mix, are still issues for debate. For instance, in Brazil, from where Ana Claudia Rosbach, regional director of CITES Alliance, will present the size model, special zones of social uh, interest. A model that is integrating housing and urban policies on the basis of Brazil's unique city statutes. SAIS has proven to be an inspiring model for movements like Slum Dwellers International and Asian Coalition for uh, Housing Rights. Finally, we will hear Gabriel Quixta, CEO of the Knowledge uh, Company, who on the basis of his recent thesis will present and discuss the experiences of the Norwegian Area Development Model. Certainly, a mix of self-help, state, municipal, and market interventions. So, to all of you, welcome to this journey where we will take you from the sprawling barriadas of Lima, Peru, and its unique self-help uh, schemes, to the size model of, of Brazil, and further to the area development approaches of Norway. I will now like to pass on the floor to uh, Odd Iglebeck, today's moderator. Odd is architect and journalist, and uh, also uh, board member of uh, Habitat Norway, the most important of all small organizations. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and in addition, I was in fact involved in the house occupancy movement in the 70s in Norway. Uh, but that was not so much to secure land, that was more to secure housing for people. And of course, some places we won and some places we lost. But now we go much further abroad. And I just think, Catherine, I give the floor to you immediately to introduce the films. Please. Thank you very much for the invitation, for this very kind introduction by Eric and by you, and to well to Habitat um, Norway for this for this event, for making this happen, and also for the um, Polytechnic Society of hosting those who are in the room, in the space, in the real space, as we are not. And I'm thanking also Claudia, Anna Claudia and, and, and Gabriel to share this discussion or this evening today with me. And to, I think it's a great opportunity to go from Peru towards Brazil to Norway and to see the different faces of, of, of incremental housing, of, of issues of, of housing that we can, we can observe also through the two films. And now I'm trying to well, I will share my screen and I will do in the same way as we did before when I was making the, um, the testing and I hope it will work. Just a second. My presentation to begin this evening is called From a Roof of My Own uh, to Ciudad Infinita and we will go through past and contemporary challenges of Lima's Barriadas seen through two documentary films, in fact, the two films we will see this evening. And I would like to give you a, a, an introduction on what, what these two films are, how they came into being, and what Lima is, what Lima is, what this city is um, that we will have a look at now. Um, 
again. No. Lima, Peru, uh, the capital of Peru, um, being located on the, on the Pacific coastline, having a population now of around 10 million inhabitants and having a particularity of being, since the mid-20th century, surrounded or rather formed by what we can call or what we do call informal, non-formal settlements that have been grown and have been um, kept coming into being through land occupation and through city making from below, through people taking uh, urban empty lands and creating neighborhoods and creating barrios there. Barriadas, the ones that start out like, like this image, as you can see here. And John Turner, the, the person, the author of this picture, uh, we will talk about him uh, later on a little bit more, his, his, his influence, he's being the father of somehow of these, not only somehow, in many ways of this project and of um, the first film as a script writer and the second film as an inspiration, taking and observing these farm, for Barriada formations in Lima, Peru in the 1960s having gone through these settlements, through important changes through the last decades, cr creating these, we can say, ever never-ending urban fringes in the north of Lima, and also creating neighborhoods like here in the south, where vertical expansion is happening and where we really can speak about solid urban structures. There is another issue just now to mention that can also be part of, the, of, of a discussion that political appropriation has come into place. Um, governments have been let's say, utilizing this this knowledge and this power from below of people to create neighborhoods in order to step away from housing policies and to do nothing to come into a kind of a laissez-faire uh, policy over many decades. Um, when I was asked in 2003 to write about the challenge of suburbia in this journal, the Architectural Design, a British Architectural Journal, which you might know, um, I started out with these two images that you see, the two images that are part of my doctoral research, in fact, and show us a certain, a, a very interesting thing that we have, the colonial imprint of the set of the, of the well-planned grid city, that's the center of Lima, that's the center of many colonial cities, and we have a reprodu reproduction in the self-built fringe in a non-planned neighborhood in nearly the same way, nearly the same scale, and we can speak about a perduring colonial imprint in that sense. This settlement that you see on the right is in fact later, in fact, um, introduced here by a Peruvian anthropologist, Jose Matos Mar, who studied the formation of the Barriadas in the 1950s and who did in some ways the opposite as planners do. He drew from what existed maps of what he has been seeing instead of, let's say, producing a map that is then going to be the basis of something to be built. And when on the invitation of writing in the architectural design, I get in touch with John Turner in these years, 2003, 2004, um, obviously being him the person to talk to as he exactly 40 years ago has edited this architectural design journal on Lima, on Peru, on the Barriadas. I get to understand that also Jose Matos Mar, the uh, anthropologist, has highly influenced Turner when he arrived in the late 1950s to Peru and when he started to observe these settlements, these self-built settlements, and starts calling them dwelling resources in South America, starts studying them. And as one of the first European architects, looks into them also from a social and political side and presents them in this journal, the architectural design, as architecture that works. We see here, by the way, the two neighborhoods that we will be looking at in the, in the documentary films. So the squatter settlement as architecture that works, Turner's view, Turner's look on these neighborhoods as a solution to a problem. Uh, and then the idea, having been in touch with him over many years already, going to visit him, going to talk to him, to interview him, and to speak about something that comes out of these interviews finally, um, that he's much more interested not only in self-building uh, um, issues, but also in the community formation processes, in interrelations inspired by the thoughts and by the schemes of Patrick Geddes, which he's explaining us in a very large interview and which is finally also been uh, portrayed and been um, reported and written about in a book that we have edited in 2018, Autoconstruction, which also translates other texts of his, which makes me also this whole, um, in this whole interaction with Turner's thoughts on community making and on holistic 
artistic thinking makes me reread the Turner, Turnerian Barriadas out of a contemporary Gadesian perspective, we could say. And looking at the valley section, this well-known section, which speaks simply about the logics of a place in each level of a, of a hill, for instance, directly uh, apply this view onto the, the, in the neighborhoods that Turner has studied in the 1960s, documented and um, and look at them through a different lens, look at them in a more holistic way, look at them out of a perspective from a contemporary view that we see these neighborhoods have changed decisively. What was said in the beginning, this change of economy is clearly there. And look at them from both these issues of what is a new economy there, what are the challenges, but what, what are also possibilities of reactivating holy or sacred spaces that exist in the area and reconnect urban spaces that are very much lacking. This as a, as a, as a kind of a framework to another encounter with Turner and finding in his archive the old story, the old film, which you will go and see in a moment, the, A Roof of My Own, my film for United Nations TV, a film that tells the story of a person that migrates from the Andes into Lima, starts up settling, creating, building a house, getting then the support from the government at the time. This is where Turner also worked as a consultant to the Peruvian government. And then so seeing these kids looking out of the window, um, obviously the question was, what do we do with this material? What can be done with, what has to be done with this material? And it was clear to me that what has to be done is that this material, which is unique and which is a, a vivid material of a creation of a neighborhood, has to go back to the place where it was made. It has to go back to El Ermitaño and has in some ways also the capacity to reactivate the urban memory of that place. And this is the beginning of the second film, which you will also see, of a new story uh, that's been written uh, in between 2016 and 2018 with a team of, of, of all young Peruvian Peruvian filmmakers and people who were helping researchers, former students of mine, and some support that we received. Um, and uh, in fact, starting out with creating a, a Facebook page, that is something one has to do today, uh, but also in with this idea that we might through the page find some of the protagonists that are part of the old film then announcing finally a screening of the old film in the neighborhood, in between, in the market. In fact, in the market, that's also part of the old film, which you will see. Activating historic map material out of Turner's um, archive and looking out for commun a community center, looking out for spaces to, to encounter people and finding this community center, self-built community center, uh, where to do the first screening. This was, in fact, exactly five years ago where we gathered people, where we met with the elderly elderly, elderly, uh, elderly people's uh, association and then set up a screening, the first screening of the old film in the neighborhood where it was filmed in 1963-64. And having a huge audience and especially a very lively debate, and this is really the beginning of the rewriting of history, in some ways also emotional moments because people were... Um, some of them were not even aware of certain things. Others had been rather uh, reluctant to speak about these terrible times that they have also gone through when setting out a neighborhood really in the middle of nowhere, out of, the, out of nothing. Interesting moments of music playing an important role of the musician. Um, only there, when being there, we found out who the musician was. His son is, actually lives still in the neighborhood. And the music started out to be an, an important also motor of, of, of memories. Um, visiting then people's houses, finding, looking through pictures, speaking to important community leaders, um, sons and people who are involved in the neighborhood since, since they were born there. But also, of, for instance, these two elderly ladies who are really the first ones to invade the place, to settle, like the picture we've seen before. You will see images in the, in the video and to um, set out their neighborhood out of, the, out of nothing in the desert ground. In this image, this is just a brief, small anecdote. In this image, the Silvina, whom you will get to know in the new film, packing a package and putting something into her bag and putting it out in the community center. And what she actually was doing, she had recorded the music that we had recuperated through going to see the musician's son. 
And since then, they were playing every afternoon in the community center this music that they hadn't been hearing for more than 50 years, but they have this kind of activated, the memory was activated through through the old film. Looking but also into new protagonists like this girl, Marjorie, who is basically dreaming of a green and healthy environment. She's suffering from lack of green spaces. And new generations also like the activists and community leader Yesenia Unia Upe, whom you will also get to know, uh, with whom we finally started speaking and started doing this film and starting asking people, what is El Ermitaño today? What are the dynamics? What are the inhabitants' aspirations and needs? And somehow in this sense, writing and telling the new story through the voices of El Ermitaño, as the new film is called. And one of the major issues is clearly being seen that they are worried about the ecology, they are about, about, worried about the fragile na natural reserves that are pressured by ongoing uh, occupation and ongoing urban growth. And ongoing urban growth that we have been able to film very nicely with this drone, for instance, which are where the, build, where the images come from. And in the end, um, a closing a circle two years after, and this is exactly now three years ago, that the film was finished and was screened for the first time in the area. Uh, these two ladies that you had seen before sitting on, on their sofa were the, ones, or the first ones to be invited and to come to the screening of their film of memory, of their own neighborhood's memory. Um, the Goethe Institute having, in, having supported the project and in that sense also given another um, panorama for exposing a neighborhood's memory also on a larger screen in the in in the, in a center in the center of lima and then finally the first screening on october the 10th in the neighborhood in the public space um with a huge uh, inter interest of people there obviously so this infin infinite city being a, a a a project that in fact is more than just a documentary, but also to be seen as a tool. And just to end up uh, some ongoing research initiatives and uh, both academic and non-academic exchange, which is ongoing, as we have been joining in other neighborhoods, showing the film and looking at documents and seeing and sharing ideas on what neighborhoods need, what are the challenges, in fact, of self-built neighborhoods in this beautiful community center built in a neighborhood right next to El Ermitaño. Also pushing some um, research collaborations with students at the time when I was teaching in Frankfurt some years ago and uh, the Catholic University, looking especially in these issues of landscape protection and, 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 and ecological challenges. The Bella Durmiente, you will see in the film, is a topic that's very very strongly there and there's lots of initiatives and that is in fact what i'm also now doing with my students here in barcelona this semester just having started learning from these community initiatives from these collective place making initiatives and collaborating cooperating with them and i'm ending up with these recent images where you see again um, yesenia unia upe the leader that you will get to know in the film who is now really doing this communal task of weekend task working and reforesting and re-greening the hills and in their surroundings and gathering people and creating community, make place making really in the real sense. And we will be looking with the students to collaborate with her directly and to see of how um, things can be well can be can be can be brought further and how these important initiatives can be um, supported. Um, in a in a in a broader sense, I think I'll I will leave it here, and um, I guess the the next step will be to see the first film. I think I'm sh share stop sharing my screen, and so you will see the old film and the new film, and you will get familiarized with all that I've been explaining um, until this point. Thank you very much. Sierra of Peru. The people who live here are Indians and they make up nearly half of Peru's population. But these people, whose forebears created the Inca Empire, now live at the edge of starvation, doomed to a life of unremitting toil and poverty. In the last two decades, the Indians of the mountains have become increasingly aware that they may find a better life in the cities. 
at least they can get nearer to it. In the city there is better food and medical care for children and schools. Perhaps too in the city their children won't be committed to loneliness. to Lima because they're looking for something better. Lima is Peru's capital and its largest city. Lima is modern, a beautiful city. But most of those who come down from the Sierra to Lima, seeking a better life, end up here in the slums. population and slums bursting at the seams are, as we all know, the lot of big cities everywhere today. The population of Lima, Peru, for instance, has trebled in the last 20 years. It's gone up from about 600,000 to over 2 million. So that even the people living in the slums pay unreasonably high rents. And sooner or later, they're bound to ask for what? They look out around the outskirts of their city and they see lots of unoccupied land which to everybody else looks like wasteland and to them looks like the green pastures. So some years ago they decided to organize in secret and set up what they call barriadas, a sort of squatters suburbs. Our system is quite simple. They would pick a night and they would pick a piece of land and they would quietly move out of the slums and invade the land in a body and then set up rough temporary shelters. Over the years, the Peruvian government came to see that though these people's mood was desperate, their needs were real. And the government started to seek legal means to help them to hold on to their barriada homesteads. In fact, the government has gone so far now that it tries to help plan these barriadas and hopes in time to extend to them the municipal services. Now, this doesn't mean that all the invasions have stopped. Our United Nations camera crew got in on a meeting which could well end in such an invasion. The people here represented a large group of slum dwellers who were determined to move out of the slums into the wasteland, whether it was state-owned or privately owned. The chairman has just said that they will pay for the land what the law requires. They want what all humanity wants, to live in dignity. Now, he's saying, once we've nominated our officers and made our organization official, we will apply to the government housing people and ask them to solve our problems and assign us a suitable block of land. If the housing administration does not solve our problems, we are determined to invade any available land because we can't go on living as we are. If we have to invade barren land, those in favor of that procedure, raise your hands. The motion is carried. If necessary, the invasion will take place. And Emilio will be our leader. Hay que llevar cuatro palos, cuatro esteras. Hay que llevar este linterna. This is Alessandro Roca. He is recalling an actual invasion, the invasion of the Ermitaño Barriada in 1962. At 11.30, on the agreed-upon night, he arrived at the main square of Cuevas, an older established Barriada nearby. Senor Roca says, well, the time came to invade. Midnight, exactly. We started to march, all happy but quiet. 
Finally, we arrived at this flat place. It was full of mud. There was alfalfa, grass, some sweet potato. It was very muddy. At 4.30 in the morning, we started to sing the national anthem of Peru. It is better not to recall these things. I suffered. Now, finally, they are going to give me my plot. But on that night, some were crying, some were laughing and clapping, and some cheered the leaders of the invasion. At almost the same moment, many of us spotted a large group of mounted soldiers coming towards us. And we started to shout, the police are coming, the police are coming. Our leaders shouted to us, don't move, you'll have to fight. So with this encouragement, with these words, we didn't move, each in his place with his children at his side, ready to fight them off with our sticks. If they fought, we would fight back. Newspaper accounts and these news photographs corroborate Senor Oca's story. The police asked for the names of the leaders, but none of the invaders would give their names. The police informed them that they had no right to take the land. Senor Oca says, everybody got ready. Other police officers kept coming back to talk with us. They told us to clear out. We said we will only leave this place dead, not alive. That morning, the invasion of the land for the Ermitaño Barriada turned into a riot. The police were forced to use tear gas. Finally, the straw huts the invaders had begun to put up were pulled down and the mats dragged away, and some people were injured. By 8.30 in the morning, most of the invaders had begun to leave the immediate vicinity, but they were determined not to go far. They reassembled on a hill nearby, while their leaders negotiated with the government to allow them to stay. A week later, they quietly returned, and the barriada was established. Senor Roca says, I know I will never forget the suffering until the day of my death. The suffering of poverty in Lima, trying to afford a roof of my own. For this, we have come here. We have suffered, but we have got our land. My hope was to get a piece of land, no matter where, however it could be got. Now I am content. Today there are many barriadas on the outskirts of Lima. Some are so new that the mat houses look very much like the huts of the slums. But there is a difference. These houses belong to the people who live in them. This will be the temporary home of a family that's just moving into the barriada of San Pedro. As soon as they are able, they'll start building a house of bricks or stone. Chances are that they will build their permanent home little by little. It will depend on their means, their own hard work, and the extent to which their government can help them. In the meantime, accepting the ancient custom of help from their neighbors, they're putting up straw mats that may be their shelter for several months and maybe for several years. As soon as people in the barriadas have some kind of roof over their heads, they pitch in to build another bigger structure. They pitch in to build a school.
Some barriadas do not have piped water supplies. This may simply be because the barriada is so new, the mains haven't been laid yet. It may be because a barriada has been built too far from the city, in which case it may never have piped water. And that's going to be a problem. Another problem. Most barriadas are some distance from Lima, and few of the families own cars. But the problems are small compared to the benefits. That's why people come to the barriadas. She and her husband and children were living all crowded together in the slums. She says, we heard there was going to be an invasion, so we joined it and came to live in Ermitaño. We left because of the children. In Lima they got sick. Here, the children are healthy and happier. Not only slum dwellers come to live in the barriadas, this man is an electrician with a reasonably good income. He says, when I married, I rented a big house for which I paid 80 soles a month. The rents have gone up 12 times until they imposed a rent of a thousand soles. I paid the thousand soles for three months. Then they gave me the alternative of getting out or paying even more, so I got out. When the invasion succeeded, I left that house and came to live here. Oswaldo Paros is an original invader in the Ermitaño Barriada. He says, People don't want money from the government so much as they want technical help. In some places, people are forming groups like the system of the old Inca times called the Minga. Heads of families from nine or ten blocks work together in a given place until the houses are up. Then they go to another place, working Sundays and holidays. In other words, they steal hours of leisure to build their houses. The painful times are past, but this song commemorates those times still. In the barriadas they brought into being, more than 350,000 people have built or are building homes of their own. Most of them come from the slums of Lima, where they had no hope of finding anything better than a ramshackle hut at an exorbitant rent. Now they are building solid homes, often with the help of their neighbors and with technical, sometimes financial, help from their government. That's why barriadas improve, while slums decay. At the time this film was made, no barriada dwellers owned the land on which they were building. But before long, they hoped to acquire the right to buy it. Javier Verlade is vice president of the Peruvian Housing Administration. Now I think that in the case of the barriadas, it should be a different approach. I think that they should pay for a piece of land with urbanized land. 
urban net with minimum services. Because in the barriers there's an investment. There's an investment in walls of bricks and, and so on that should be channelized. And uh, if we can give them urbanized land, they could give us their economical support with this uh, work they, they do by themselves. And eventually, in five or six years, they could have a decent home. Would they own their houses or would they rent? Yes, them? no, no, they would own the houses. They would own the houses because as low income brackets, we study more of them, we find that they seek security with ownership. And they desire the ownership and we have to find a way of giving them this. So we would give <coughs> them the opportunity to cooperate with them giving them technical advice and helping them to build the rest of the house. Do you think that the people who are now building in the Barriadas would go for this kind of idea? I think so, yes. I've talked to many of them and uh, what they seek is security towards the ownership, but they see that uh, they can't be served with water or sewage. They've gone into the land, the, in the, the ladders of the mountains, where it makes it impossible to finance uh, uh, economic uh, sewage and water. Now, in this case, we have looked for flat land near the urban area and near the lines of transportation. In this case, they would feel more living with the community facilities that the city can offer. And to the city, the expenses would be much lesser. We have to uh, realize that we are a, uh, a, a, an underdeveloped country and that we can't afford certain luxuries and, as in the United States. We can't spread the city. We have to concentrate the, the, the city in order not to dis disperse our expenses. Celia Campas de Campania. Senora Campania is telling us that the Housing Administration now has a team at the Ermitaño Barriada composed of architects, engineers and social workers like herself. As for the social workers, she says, our job is first of all to understand the needs of the people and to help them with their problems and to prepare them for life here in the Barriada. The architects and engineers give them the technical aid they need in the construction of their homes. This is a far cry from the reception the people of the Ermitaño Barriada received when they invaded the land. And this house in the Comas Barriada is a far cry from a temporary straw shack. The Cordova family has lived in their shack for six years already, waiting for their permanent home to be finished. Even though her family can't move in yet, Senora Cordova is proud of her new house. She's showing it to an architect employed by the Peruvian Housing Administration, who is also a consultant to the United Nations on squatter settlements. Other international experts are concerned with overcrowding in cities like Calcutta, London, Rome, and New York. Their reports make up a pool of United Nations experience that is invaluable to housing planners all over the world. Senora Cordova has shown him the dining room and the living room. She leads the way into the kitchen. She explains that the water is being installed. The bathroom. The water is in, but it can't be used until there's drainage. There will be a shower here. This is a bedroom. There are three bedrooms. Someday, when they have the money, there will be a second floor in the house for the children. 
It will be the same as the first one. These children have come a long way from here. Someday these people who have so little may move to one of the barriadas and find there the better life for which they came to the city. This is a marketplace in a barriada. It looks like any other marketplace, but it shows the extent to which barriadas have become established. It means the barriada has become a community in its own right. Many people are now working as well as living in the barriadas. More and more jobs are becoming available in the market in small shops and other services. Barriadas are not necessarily the solution to the housing problems of many of the world's big cities. They're not even the whole solution to Lima's problems, but they're one solution, and unique in that it has come from the people themselves. Mr. Fernando Balaonde Terry, the president of Peru. The expression mutual aid has a, the same meaning all over the world, the same literary meaning. But in the case of Peru, it has a philosophical, a historical meaning. Because our own civilization, uh, which didn't have a monetary system, practiced mutual aid as the only source of production. That is why we had such large road construction systems, such wonderful agriculture, terracing, channels, irrigation. That is why we are hoping to mix this modern economy, which will mean paying uh, for technical direction, for machinery, for tools, and the old archaic economy, which will mean giving the will and the effort to do things without an economic interest, without a personal interest, but with high cooperative ideals. If we succeed, as we are doing now, to continue these two systems in an, an economy that could be called a half-breed economy, then this period of transition to a modern system, a fully modern system, will be shorter, and we will soon reach the goal we need to raise the standard of living of our peoples. I must say I'm very impressed and very happy. I've been interested in urban development for 50 years, but I never think I've seen any so well documented and challenging as these films. So thanks a lot to Catherine and uh, all the crew which have brought this to us. Uh, we are just about running on time, I think, and we will now move on to Brazil uh, with Ana Claudia Rosbach of the City Alliances uh, and uh, her theme will be the other approaches for improvement, area development, the size model of Brazil. So, Ana Claudia, please. Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Odd. Thank you, Eric, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and with 
uh, the team and supporters of Habitat Norway. It's very nice to see how the film uh, ended up being. Uh, Catherine, congratulations. I'm very, very well impressed. Uh, I remember when we discussed at the beginning uh, and your trip to Peru and everything. So I'm very glad to know that it's finished and it's beautiful and really inspiring and made me and make us think a lot about, you know, what now, especially in times of COVID. And yeah, um, also greetings to Gabriel, uh, who is part of this panel as well. So I would like to uh, share a presentation here that I prepared. So. I, I fully agree with the arguments um, by Karin and Katrin in the in the movie, right? Uh, we are now um, actually the poor in Latin America. Um, they found in slums, in favelas, in Brazil, in villas, in Argentina, in all these uh, similar spaces, informal settlements. Um, in Latin America, they found an opportunity to join the city. And everything that the city has to offer, uh, there are many studies that prove that um, the IDB has studies. There are studies from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I'm sure there are others. How the social indicators, the social economic indicators improved uh, in the last, let's say, 40, 30, 40 years, um, at the same time as the continent um, you urbanized. So we saw here in Brazil improvement of uh, indicators such as citizenship, gender equality, um, access to services, uh, um, education, health indicators. So there was a significant improvement that took place uh, together with the urbanization process. And um, this was uh, thanks to the opportunities, the doors, the gates to the cities uh, provided by, uh, by informal settlements. So uh, I prepared this small presentation where uh, I share a little bit about um, the, the context that we face here in the in the global south, our urban context, and also um, a couple of examples of how the national policies, the national urban policies in Brazil, and uh, a little zoom in São Paulo, uh, managed created some instruments that um, that that help us help our cities. Um, to improve the situation, the situation of people living in urban poverty. Uh, we are far from, from of course, uh, uh, having equitable cities, uh, equity of opportunities uh, for our citizens. And our, cities are, our cities are still very fragmented. Uh, what we see right now with COVID is that um, informal occupations are expanding in all forms, uh, in the peripheries, um, in uh, central areas, in empty buildings, uh, on the streets. Uh, we, um, we can see it's visible here. I'm talking to you from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I see how uh, how many uh, how much homelessness we do have in the city. At the same time, I see buildings. Um, uh, uh, being built by the private sector, you know, um, to a demand um, that we don't know, right? So we see the needs expanding and we see buildings being built and uh, there's a mismatch somehow and we need to address, right? Uh, so this is the reality that we have. That we have structural inequalities. We have segregated cities. The markets in our cities are dysfunctional and without regulations, um, the current segregations that we face, they will only be exacerbated. We have a situation where we still have resettlements, we have evictions, we have removals, and, um, and um, we already learned that they are never a solution. Um, we, we really need at this point in time, uh, and especially seeing the impact of COVID, really to say no to evictions. Uh, and, and this is a basic human right, and um, uh, we learn uh, that all the impacts from evictions are negative at all levels. Impact of uh, in terms of human rights, the social impact, economic impacts, environmental impacts, etc. We also learned that uh, we need to combine curative and preventive policies. We still need to build houses, but we have this huge um, assets of a build, a build environment that we need to improve, we need uh, to integrate to the city. And we also uh, learned that um, the private sector alone will not solve the problem, the current uh, 
public-private partnerships experience that we have are very limited. So there's a clear need uh, for public investments and subsidies for us uh, to really overcome uh, the challenges that we face in terms of uh, low-income housing needs. So this is an example from Brazil. This picture is well known. You can see a favela, a slum, uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and you can see here the extreme levels of segregation, right? You see at uh, one side this uh, very uh, uh, high, luxurious, uh, uh, gated community, uh, high-rise building, and next door, uh, a slum, a favela, in very precarious um, living conditions. So this is an extreme picture, but it shows really well how the markets work with South regulation and uh, how the city evolve without subsidies and interventions uh, from uh, from the government. So uh, um, how, what do you, we do here in Brazil in terms of national urban policy to, to deal with the situation? So what happened between 1988 and 2021? So 1988 was critical because uh, we introduced an urban chapter in our constitution. It was the first democratic constitution that we had. So it was a, a constitution uh, uh, that had um, a decentralized centralization as, as a central perspective and where the planning functions were delegated to cities. Also required cities to do master plans and also recognize, and this is very, very important, the social function of the land and the city property. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's no respect towards the private property, but it means that the private property, the land, the city needs to have a social function. The collective interest must prevail over the uh, uh, private interests. And this is also very important. The Constitution provides security of tenure for families living in urban areas up to uh, 250 square meters for over uh, five years without opposition. So this is a huge uh, push towards security of tenure. But what happened after the Constitution in 1988? We had several cities implementing pilot experiences that were, re that were afterwards recognized in 2001 through this law that is very famous called the city statute. Uh, what does the city statute law has? First of all, it says cities need to be managed in a democratic manner. So these master plans required by the constitutions, they need to be discussed with the civil society. Second, it provides cities with instruments for regularization of pro and property titles. Um, third, it, uh, it provides cities with this instrument instrument called the special areas of social interest. They are very important, and I will explain later on how they are important to protecting for existing formal settlements, but also to reserve area in the city for new developments, for new low-income income housing uh, projects. And then Another feature of the city statute is, is that it provides intro instruments to cities to increase uh, financing alternatives through a land value capture. So let's look at Sao Paulo, Brazil. So Sao Paulo is a big city, a megalopolis, where 30% of the population lives in really in substandard conditions. So uh, we have implemented the social, the special zones of social interest since um, uh, 15 years already. It evolved through uh, two democratic master plans. And what is the advantage of this area? So first of all, many areas are ear market. Uh, many occupied areas, informal settlements, are ear market as special zones of social interest. And with this ear marking, the city is able to provide land tenure to fast track land regularization and also to um, apply flexible standards for building and, uh, and public spaces in these areas. Um, as uh, the film and the old movie adequately stated, we cannot promote these areas as we do in the formal cities. We, do, we need to uh, develop those areas incrementally, and we need flexible standards. And this is an issue that many countries face. Let's say South Africa, let's say India, let's say uh, you know many African countries, many Latin American countries. So there is a need to flexibilize the standards and to fast track um, the, the land regularization. And um, public works um, and incremental improvement 
they need to take place on a parallel basis as land are regularized. We cannot wait until all land are regularized to come with um, the improvements in the infrastructure and housing. And then the other feature of these areas is that they can reserve uh, land in the city, vacant areas, underutilized areas for uh, future provision of social interest housing. So this is what uh, these zones uh, do. And here, this is how uh, they are earmarked in the city of Sao Paulo. You can see um, the, the zones earmarked as interest zoning, but you can also see the potential of vacant and underutilized land in the cities that are also earmarked. So what the city is doing here in Sao Paulo, they are notified vacant land, underutilized property. And uh, owners, they will have to use that. Otherwise, they will have to pay more taxes. Or they even might need to uh, give these spaces for the city uh, to promote as uh, low-income housing. The city is also selling the air rights, the construction rights, and uh, under the assumption that the land is private, but the air is collective, the air is public. So uh, if builders want to build more than one size, um, the, the, the size, one time the size of the land, they have to pay extra to the city. And money goes to a fund that is being used for social housing and for infrastructure, especially in precarious areas, in precarious neighborhoods. This all associated with housing policy tools can be a powerful combination to expand the provision of social housing, expand the funding available for, for social housing, the processes of land regularization, and the overall integration of these areas in the cities, mainstreaming informal settlements in city planning. So um, a, a, a scenario that allows combined investments, fiscal resources, land-based investments from the city and from the national level to add to the individual, to the family efforts of self-building, the social production that Catherine was mentioning, you know, uh, with a strong, robust uh, infrastructure and investment. So it's time to recognize uh, that, um, you know, public attention needs to be given to, this, to these areas. Recognize their rights, recognize the work of the people in building their houses in the neighborhood incrementally, but we need now to open ways to mainstream these areas into city planning, integrate those areas properly in the city, and inject public investments there. And this is the, the results that one can have in investing in infrastructure, in public spaces, in new houses, in these areas that were built uh, by, by the poor. So what happens this year? The city law is from 2001, it's uh, 20 years old. So what we got after, you know, 20 years of the city status. I believe we manage in terms of recognizing all you know, uh, these areas. We minimize the evictions. We still have evictions, but we could have a lot more if it was not for the, this constitutional provision of security of tenure. We were able uh, to implement um, large-scale Islam upgrading programs, reaching for more than 2 million households, improving their lives, uh, providing access to water, sanitation, drainage um, through rehabilitation and integration progress uh, processes. Uh, I believe we evolved a lot in terms of the appropriation of cities by their cities by their citizens with a full generation. We are going to the second generation of democratic master plans with increased uh, public participation. Where we failed was still on the capture and redistribution of urban value. We are still really, really lacking behind. We could capture much more from those buildings that are being built by the private sector, and we could be using much more um, the spaces in the cities that are underutilized and, and, and vacant. Um, I gave an example of Sao Paulo that uh, is notifying uh, uh, property owners, but we have 5, 000, over 5,000 cities in Brazil, and uh, we really need to evolve um, in this process. Uh, we also need to use urban planning to strengthen the human rights agenda, uh, gender equality, um, you know, um, 
LGBTQIA plus uh, people, the historically excluded groups. Uh, we need to address the climate emergency. And these are the areas where we need um, to evolve. So I just wanted to finish this presentation sharing this message. The land is at the core of the problem that we are facing in our cities in terms of inequalities, but it's also the solution. Planning and regulations, governance, participatory go governance are key to ensure that we recognize the social function of the land and the right to the city in our cities. We need to have proper urban legal frameworks. We need to change the laws at the national level. We need at the city level to have inclusive and participatory planning in mainstreaming those areas that have been marginalized and is excluded over the years, recognize the work of people uh, and enable through that Islam upgrading and the supply of well-located land for the people. And for that, and considering the, the high pressures on, on, the, on, the, on the surrounding uh, environments, we need to maximize the use of vacant and under, underutilized land. So we need to have flexible standards, but we also need uh, to uh, put strong market regulations in place and add uh, to public investments and, and subsidies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna Claudia, for your focusing on the authorities and on the rights of the land and the democratic rights of the land. And I'm also glad you mentioned evictions, uh, which is increasing. We inhabited Norway has been trying to get the Norwegian oil fund, which are investing in uh, banks and Blackstone, different funds, to change their policies uh, and have a more active role in stopping evictions through these uh, financial institutions. And we hope to we can develop this work and also have cooperation with uh, other people around the world. Uh, so again, we should focus more on eviction, I think, in Habitat Norway and the, in our politics. Thanks for that. So let's go to Norway for the last 15 minutes and to Gabriel Quickstar. And what are the challenges here? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what are the challenges here? Uh, uh, they might be vast. Uh, we are, are in a different, uh, maybe physical state than what we saw in uh, Lima. But still, uh, there are very interesting uh, what we can find on the organizational level that are very similar. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Eric and uh, to Odd for inviting me, and uh, to uh, Catherine and Anna Claudio to be in uh, your presence and to in your company. I feel very honored and uh, uh, I'm not at all at your level, so please, uh, please bear with me. Um, but this is uh, an interesting case and I will now go from Lima to Oslo and try to see uh, some similarities on the organizational level. In uh, Norway, we uh, do have uh, problems and challenges with, uh, let's say, on the human level or with uh, loneliness. We have uh, uh, challenges with, uh, with how our society works. And um, the same uh, way that Lima is uh, and has organized the uh, barriadas, maybe we are actually moving in the direction where they have, uh, they have been for a very long time. So that is very interesting to see how we can learn. Uh, my name is Gabriel Quickstad, I'm a civil engineer. I am a founder and entrepreneur of Kunskapskompanie and uh, currently working on uh, network governance in uh, Oslo and Norway. Uh, I'm a board member of Amnesty International Norway and uh, also in the steering committee of uh, Collingwood World Summit. Um, now we will focus on the area development through network governance. And that, uh, and my um, take on this will come through the innovation districts as is quite similar 
to uh, what Anna Claudio mentioned about uh, interest zoning, but not in the lower income uh, standard, but towards innovation. Uh, we've all seen this before quite a lot of time. It's uh, how the world urbanizes. The number now is 68.4. Uh, that is the forecast for what we uh, the think is the level of the world's population in uh, living in cities in 2050. So how do we distribute the power when so many people are living in cities? Should we do it through the standard government ways? or should we do it through the market? Let me see. But there is uh, also, let me see, here we go back. Uh, there we are. Um, when we combine the uh, urbanizing trends and uh, with uh, how we uh, usually distribute uh, power, uh, we will see that we have a less available area and the local governments, uh, they need a place to build the cities bigger. We have more complex ownership, there are more land owners now uh, and the dialogue makes it more difficult. Uh, we have the SDGs, we have some goals that we need to reach in a short time and this results in a, uh, that a hierarchical uh, government structure and market economy is probably insufficient. So back to these two, or to the uh, network version as well. And this is kind of something new we're uh, including in uh, how we see uh, area development in uh, Norway and uh, internationally but maybe this is exactly what they've done in Lima uh, and other places for a very long time. So to the uh, definition of this middle, the network governance. Uh, network governance is characterized by organic or informal social systems in contrast to bureaucratic structures within firms and formal relationships uh, between them. And how we can build collaborative uh, network models like we saw in the video, exactly the same. Uh, and who? Sectors, government, industry, university, and the civil society, exactly what we saw. This is very interesting uh, to me, and the films were, uh, were very interesting, absolutely. And this is some kind of stupid picture of what a network might look like. Um, this makes no sense but I found it on the internet. So when we say that now are we, uh, we should work through a network, and this is our answer, that can't be right. And back to the relationship between the Bariadas and how the area development uh, are happening in Norway at the, the moment with the innovation district model. Um, we have talked about uh, the good sides and the bad side uh, of the Barriada movement. And then uh, let's continue now with the hypothesis that it is substantial similarities between the Barriadas and the network governance model. Could the Barriadas movement give something to the network governance and vice versa? Could the Barriadas use a network-based governance model or are they already doing it. I have a few experiences from uh, uh, Norway, uh, which I would like to include. Uh, and uh, I would start with how uh, it's better uh, a network governance model uh, in comparison to uh, the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, market version or uh, the uh, more uh, public version is um, that it better collaboration across relevant actors. It really does, uh, when we see the local networks they are making in Oslo and Trondheim, uh, they are bettering it, but 
still there are some uh, challenges. Uh, we see that new methods for inhabitant involvement is working better. We have the model called Pådriv in Norway, uh, which is uh, based on Cotter's uh, way of uh, changing leadership. And then uh, we see that the network is partly dependent on resources from the members and partly uh, from what they jointly can achieve. Uh, and then we see that unity might be a better result and we might see better uh, unity in Norway as we see in some places in Lima. But there are also bad experiences. Uh, when we go uh, away from the uh, government model, uh, where we have strict rules on how information should get out, we see that often the intention is to give it out, but still often comes uh, like second. It's not that important for, and now I'm talking leadership models between maybe um, uh, a pro-rector of uh, the universities uh, coming together with some CEO of the student uh, housing organization and uh, maybe the mayor or some level uh, in between, but um, we are on a high level still in these networks. The media has less knowledge about innovation districts and how uh, the uh, network governance in Norway is uh, actually changing the country. Uh, they have less accessibility and less control. And these kind of networks can be very effective, but the process can be less available for those not represented in the usual uh, hierarchical and government-based management. So, uh, if we go to uh, network models, uh, they might have unclear objectives, they might have unclear expectation and lack of control and management. I should be quick here now. But if we go to the theory on how network is uh, working as a governance model, uh, we see that who is responsible for the failure or success when you have, uh, for example, Oslo Science City or Innovation District Hovinbyen here in Oslo. These are big areas, um, but uh, for one of the area, um, areas, we have the headmaster of uh, the University of Oslo is uh, the steering committee leader. Should he be responsible for how that uh, urban area is to be developed? How is uh, the state of the democracy in the network governance model? And they're, quite, uh, they're not mature at all. So, at, uh, at the point, I'd say quite bad. Uh, but Sörensen and Tofting, uh, back to theory, uh, has defined some criteria for democracy and efficiency in networks, as we saw in the films, as we heard Anna Claudio mention. Um, but uh, these two guys have uh, made four uh, notes. The networks must be controlled by the people's representatives. Second, networks must act on behalf of their members. Thirdly, representatives must be responsible and visible to the inhabitants. And these kind of um, networks taking uh, government functions must also follow democratic rules and norms like transparency. If these criteria and comments are handled well, we might see uh, employees uh, in Norwegian and other municipalities uh, go to cities uh, of Peru and uh, in Lima maybe to learn about how the we in Norway can build more functional societies. And uh, after watching these videos, uh, in my opinion, it's very interesting to see behind the physical, but uh, to watch how they have organized themselves and how they work for 
the better life of the inhabitants together. That is kind of the society we want to have all over in the Western world, and I really hope that uh, we manage to uh, get there. And we have uh, challenges in Norway, and we have challenges in Peru, but we we'll, should continue to talk uh, to each other, and uh, the films was absolutely amazing to, to watch. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel, for introducing the democracy issue. Uh, I think there is one thing we have learned today, and that is that um, the, the, the urban development in the world is tremendous, it's gr big, it's growing, and uh, more and more people live in cities. But there is no quick fix in any city. There are uh, Po constant political fights uh, for, for democracy, for power, and how the city should develop, should it spread out, should it go up, etc., etc. And uh, it's very. This is the first time I'm a moderator at a kind of uh, internet conference, uh, but I think it's it's a great experience because we can exchange view very quickly, and, uh, and uh, we should have uh, maybe we should have planned more to have a bit more debate uh, when we have today. But uh, thanks to all uh, who participated, and thank to all of you who have been watching us. And uh, please join Habitat Norway if you're not already our member. Thank you very much today. And now Eric wants to have a few lines at the end. Thank you, Odd. And thank you to um, our speakers, Catherine and uh, Anna Claudia and Gabriel for uh, excellent and really thought-provoking uh, interventions. I just want to remind you that Habitat Day is the first event of the Urban October campaign. We will screen the two videos we will have discussions, first uh, at the uh, Oslo Met Urban uh, Research uh, Conference on 27th of uh, October at 4 o'clock. Then in Trondheim with uh, NTNU University and uh, the Trondheim uh, Housing uh, Association. Uh, at the 28th, uh, at 8.30 at Cinemateke. And finally, in Stavanger, uh, at Odeon uh, Cinema, uh, on 9 uh, November, uh, at uh, 7 o'clock. I think the, the entry points to these meetings will be uh, somewhat different from today, where we have been focusing on, uh, on models. But we certainly encourage uh, all everybody interested in uh, urban uh, development uh, and uh, poverty and social sustainable development to take part. Please follow uh, over uh, Habitat Norway uh, homepage www.habitatnorway.no Thank you very much.